Welcome to Cyber Frontier, bringing you the latest news, trends, and hottest topics that focus on advances in cybersecurity and cyber industry economics. Our expert yet down-to-earth hosts make cybersecurity straightforward. They ask the tough questions and make this challenging topic something that everyone can understand. Our candid approach lets guests open up on topics we would all like to see addressed. You can find us on the web at newcyberfrontier.com. That's www.newcyberfrontier.com. Now join today's host as he introduces the topic for today's new Cyber Frontier. Welcome to today's episode of New Cyber Frontier. On today we have Chris Gibson from the UK. He is the Executive Director of FIRST, which is Forum for Incident Response and Security Teams. So Chris, welcome. Thanks for joining today from all the way across the pond. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a real honor to be here. I appreciate it. Yeah, so we're, what, what plus eight there? Plus seven? Uh, it's five, just ten past five in the afternoon here. Okay, we're at ten o'clock in the morning here, so we get... Exactly. Um, so, Chris, uh, first, give us a little bit about what that is, a little bit about your mission. Uh, just a little bit, though. We'll get into the details later. Of course. So, first is, is, is genuinely, the clue is in the name. It's the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams. It's a, a, an inclusive community, a global community of incident response and security experts where we try and build trust, we try and build a, a common understanding, we try and help each other with, with best practices. We get together some 20, 30 times a year at various events and we try and make the world uh, from incident response a better place by educating people and uh, raising the, the highlight of them. Okay, so um, now a little bit about you. You said, you know, we'll get about first, but how did you get into where you're at? What's your what's your background? Gosh, right. Uh, well, my background is sort of interesting, uh, you know, in a very strange way. Uh, I was trained as a land surveyor. My first four years of my working life, I spent bouncing around the desert in Saudi Arabia looking for oil. Um, this was about the time that the first PCs came out in the mid '80s. Um, we had them on the crew that I worked for. I liked them. I felt like sort of a, I could I could understand them, so to speak. And I sort of want and I wanted to move out of that that land surveying world into into computer technology. This again, late eighties. Uh, I went to work for a bank. I worked there for a few years. I transferred to a bigger global bank, and ended up in their incident security team. Uh, there. In fact, Steve Katz, one of the very first CISOs in the world, he was my boss's boss. It was, it was a truly awesome experience where we tried to build that very early. How do we make the world secure? How do we do this properly? Um, since then, I moved into incident response. I moved into forensics. That's my sort of commercial grant. That's what I do for my day job. But for a number of years, I was a volunteer with FIRST, the city group, the bank I worked for, or was a member of FIRST. I was their, their rep into the organization. I was on the board of FIRST for some 10 years. Just love what they do. It's a really interesting space. It's all about building networks, trust and community. I feel very lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. And, and I just, just you know, hit the, hit the wave as it went through and have enjoyed every minute of it. But it's a, you know, you're doing good stuff type thing. It's trying to make the world a better place, being, being sort of vaguely vocational. So you've been with FIRST a while. But first has a big history. You were telling me before the show, been around since how long? What's when did it get found? Early nineties. Um, first, so so if you look at incident response, the very first big worm was the Morris worm, um, which is where the, uh, sort of ten percent of the internet got taken down by a, by a worm that was kicked off by a research student um, to sort of evaluate stuff, and it spun out of control slightly. That was when Cert CC was formed, which is sort of a, a real nascent part of the of the internet security community in, in the US. Fa fast forward a year, there was a second worm. Um, this hit, uh, went around the world again, and people realized that although there were people who touched on security in the, in this this internet of, you know, very early internet, there weren't really any organization. There was no structure. There was no, there was no proper organization. It, people knew people, so they called their friends. That was that kind of relationship. And they thought, you know what, we need to sort of get together. We need to talk about this. We need to collaborate. We need to to work on how to do this better. And that's genuinely how FIRST was formed. At the time, it was about 15 teams. Um, we've grown significantly since then. Uh, 2014, when I when I stepped away, when I, I changed some of my jobs, we had 250 teams. In the last five years, we've literally doubled. We're now at 506 teams, I believe. We're in 94 countries around the world. We have everything from your Microsofts and Oracles and Palo Altos and Cisco's through to 
Oxford University cert and um, you know UK or the cert the National Cyber Security Centre UK. So we had this huge range of people in our in our membership, all joined as teams, and they bring different perspectives on everything that we do. So universities typically have a really interesting life because they have lots of students who do strange things. Banks can't afford to be hacked, so they have a very different take on how the internet security incident should be run. But we bring all those people together at a number of events. Um, we had one this year in Edinburgh, or last year in Edinburgh, 1,100 people turned up for a week to talk about this. Where we bring them together, we learn, we collaborate, we coordinate, we build trust. When I've got a problem the other side of the world, I know I now can call someone on the other side of the world. Okay. In 94 countries, we've still got another 94 to go somewhat about that. But, you know, that's the mission is to build that out and build that down. All right, we're going to take a break. Hear from our sponsors. Be right back. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. Welcome back to New Cyber Frontier. Today we're talking with Chris Gibson from FIRST uh, in the UK. Uh, and Chris, we were going, you know what, first in the detailed what you've done, how long you've been around. Um, first question I had while you were talking is, how are you part of any government? Are you part of the UK, sponsored? funded by what's the uh, relationship there with standardization or even you know governments so, so no we're, we're not part of any government we are we are what we call pretty a non-government organization we are legally headquartered out of the u.s mainly because the the original founding members were u.s based and once the organization got to the point where it needed to rent hotels and things for organization you know for, for meetings we needed a structure to do that so it was founded in the u.s that's purely the only reason we our money comes from either membership, there's, a, there's an annual dues to join, and the sponsorship and or registration from the events we run. So again, you know, the Edinburgh event, for instance, 1,100 people turn up, they, you know, they pay to come mm -hmm. as a registration fee. We get sponsorship from, from some significant organizations who sponsor those. As a non-profit, you know, we, we, it's, we don't call that profit, we call that surplus, and we take that money and we reinvest that straight back into the community. Okay. So, while we have our organization and we do the training, we also have done quite a, we do a lot of uh, training for nation, uh, national capacity building, say for incident response teams, small countries in the Pacific who want to build a national sea cert, you know, we'll help them with that. We have special interest groups, which we fund. So we've just literally released one where we, we, we're talking about the ethics of being an incident response team. Really, really important to us about what sort of values people should have as that, how they should work how that should work. We want that to be an industry-wide thing. That is not specifically a first piece. So we fund a website, we, you know, we fund a SIG, we, we run their web conferences, we provide support. We use the money, the, the surplus we gain out of our, our daily work, so to speak, and push that back into the community, absolutely to fulfill the sort of the four missions or the four pillars of things we do. Interesting. Um, and so as far as, uh, what does a member get for their membership? You know, what, what kind of features do you offer? What would I get if I signed up as a member? Because I'm not so, just curious. Right. So, so again, we're back to that. We, we, we're literally, a, we're a forum. We're a place <clears> where people come together. So, so as a member, there are mailing lists you can get access to. There are information sharing platforms that we run, uh, which we're, we're working on to, to boost up. But there are some of those that we run that allow people to share information. To, to, to learn from each other. There's a certain kudos of being a member of FIRST, I think. You know, the fact that a team is a FIRST member is really quite important to a lot of people. But it's really a, a you know, it's $2,000 a year. It's for, for someone like Microsoft or, or Oracle or whoever, you know, it's not a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, and it gives them access to all these other viewpoints on the problems that we face. So yeah. they're not just looking at it from their own, you know, way of thinking. They're also looking at what would a university think about this or what would a, a nation state think about this or what would a, a mm -hmm. third world country think about this and so on. So it gives them that ability to tap into that network. Yeah, I, I hear so many organizations in cybersecurity, let's get us, let's get us an event together. Let's get a forum. Let's start talking. They put whatever out there and 
crickets, you know. It's yeah. and because yeah. they have nothing really to offer. It's like the chicken and the egg. Until you have content, mm -hmm. it's not worth paying for. But until you get users built up, you don't get content. So it's a real I, challenge. And, and to be fair, you know, we've all sat there. There are two. You know, I, I would quite happily argue there are too many people doing this. Yes. Really, you know, people want to do it. I'm all for doing it. But try and do it joined up. Try and think about how you do it. You know, we we we. I, when I was on the board of first back in. 2004, 2014, if we hit sort of 500 people at a conference, we thought we were doing really well. We mm -hmm. had 1,100 people turn up in Edinburgh. You know, it's, I think there's a, there's an understanding that's starting to take, that's rippling through the world that says, actually, you can't defend your way out of this problem. As an organization, you know, the old days, you, you spent money on firewalls, you spent money on defenses. People are realizing that, yeah, you can do that, but that's not the be all and end all. And you are going to have to expect to have a, an event that you will need to manage because if you do that then you you'll be more prepared than you know if you, you focus on defending and when it goes wrong you haven't put any thought into how you're going to do that so that reaction that incident response that incident management you know we can all name com companies and, and people who've done this really quite badly mm -hmm. through the communications they put out or through their the, the drip of the bad news rather than managing it through the the Twitter, I mean, these days, the, the days when you had a bit of time to work out what your message was going to be have long gone. You know, Twitter, social media is going to be blitzing you if you've been hacked. You know, you, they, you will probably learn about it through that rather than through any other means. And you need to be very quick at responding to that. And that's a really different thing from what most big organizations, communications, you know, functions are. They're, they're corporate comms. You know, they, they look at I's and cross T's and want it to be perfect. You can't be doing that. So, having a plan having exercised it having thought about it so when you have an incident you can you know your senior management will walk in and just run with it really really powerful and i think that's where we're also focusing people so actually you know we need a plan these are the guys who can help us build that plan because they you know they've been doing this for years hmm. and that's what we focus on and bringing them together so you don't have a a service you sell professional staffed technology no. that you have frameworks no, I, am, I am the one and well so I am the one and only full-time employee of First. It's a wholly volunteer-run organization. We pay for services, so there's an account, there's a website, stuff like that. But what we do, and one of the, the four missions that we have, is this sort of global language where we try and build standards. Mm -hmm. So the CVSS standard, Common Vulnerability Scoring System, that's ours. We own that standard. We have a working group that works to constantly improve it. They've just released ver version 3.1. I think we're up, we'll be releasing version 4 in a year or so, which will be a big change. But, you know, we're trying to build standards so people can then start automating and talking in that common language. Mm -hmm. CVSS was born because back in the day, you know, Microsoft would release a patch and say it's super critical. Well, what does that mean? You know, and, and Oracle and all these other people. And there was no common understanding of what that really meant. And to be fair, it depends on how you're using the product. And so on. That's where CVSS comes in. So it was developed by, I think, MITRE in the US or one of the US companies organizations but we took it on as a neutral non-profit global organization we run a CISA framework standard so if you're building a CISA we have a framework that says these are the sort of things you can do these are the services you could offer you know you don't have to do them all and I would strongly suggest you don't do them all but these are the things you can offer and these are the, this is how you underpin those so you can build them consistently and build them well rather mm -hmm. than you know, a guy walks past management's desk, manager says, you're the CSERT guy, go build one. And the guy's like, I, I have no idea what I've got to do here. You know, what, what do I need? How do I do that? Who do I talk to? Well, we can help in all of those pieces. You know, we can help you build it. We can help you learn from other people. We can introduce you. We can build that network. That's really, really important as, because we need to spin these things up much more quickly than we used to. Yeah, you, you and I are in the same, same space. How do we build awareness? How do we link everything together? Um, and, you know, it has to start somewhere. And uh, yes. we, we've done pretty well as, as a podcast. We probably have the, the biggest following of any that I've, I'm aware of. Um, and, uh, and sometimes we, we, we kind of look at, we probably hit about, you know, thirty to 50,000 people a month that are engaged with this. Uh, and our worldwide is growing, which is why we're reaching out uh, now to, to people like yourself, trying to get different perspectives from different parts of the globe. We actually have a big following in the UK, about 10% of, uh, of our listener base is over there. Wow, that's very slick. So if you're in the UK and you're listening, thanks for <laughs> joining uh, somebody in your your neck of the woods. And we definitely would like some more people to, to bring in from, from UK. I know Brexit has, has some, uh, some changes coming down the road, and uh, 
We're going to take a break here from our sponsors, but I want to I want to hear from you about what you think about what's going on over there. We'll be right back. Murray Security Services are your cybersecurity experts with decades of experience providing professional training services for our clients in various industries. We offer professional training and certification in areas of cybersecurity, safety, health, and environmental services at our academy. Our in-person and online training provides a collaborative environment where students can interact directly with instructors through live chats or in private classrooms. Visit murraysecurityservices.com for more information. Welcome back to New Cyber Frontier. Today talking to Chris Gibson uh, from the UK, the Executive Director of FIRST, the Forum for Incident Response and Security Teams. Um, now, we, we before the break, we mentioned that there's a, there's a big governmental change going on over there, right, with Brexit. What's your spin on what you see and how it affects security? So I, I, I live in hope. I, so, so this is where we get, you know, as a non-government organization, we, we try not to get involved in politics. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are times we have no choice. There are, you know, certain sanctions that have gone around that have caused us those issues. Up till now, though, the Brexit debate really hasn't affected us. And this is sort of where one of, one of my challenges is, you know, we, we are very much an organization that networks, brings people together. But the fact that I'm in the UK is, is frankly immaterial. When my job, my role, my job was advertised, it could have been anywhere on the planet. Um, I just happen to be in the UK and I'm, I'm very grateful that I got the job. So I don't think it's going to cause a lot of problems. What does cause the problems are, are some of the sort of the, the, the regulations that we're seeing coming out of various governments around the world that says, you know, you can't talk to these people, you can't talk to these people. Um, you know, there are, there are very, you know, the, the, to be blunt, you know, the OFAC sanctions, the biz sanctions, there are sanction, other sanctions around the world that inter interfere with what we do. And I don't believe by design, um, I think you know they're, they're aimed at a very specific, for a very specific reason, and you know perfectly justifiable reason. But the nuance of the language is such that it also impacts the information sharing that we do when we are trying to help each other, you know, manage incidents and resolve incidents. You know, there are two things that we do that, that realistic, or the two things we resigned on are, are trust and, and a common goal. Mm -hmm. First teams typically have a common goal. They want to make the internet better. They want to make it safer. They want to help their constituents and they want to help each other do that. And to do that, they need to trust each other. And, and we run very much at that sort of personal team, but personal level. So a, a Brexit is not going to impact us. Some of the, in, the sanctions that, that are being pushed through, for, say, to for some of the big uh, Chinese companies, because of the things they prohibit, have caused us to have to to take a good hard look at that and to be fair I'm spending a lot of money on sanctions lawyers that I'd rather not be spending because of those sanctions that's why one of the pillars or one of the missions that we're pushing we push quite heavily over the last few years is more on the policy and governance debate for, for many many years first mm -hmm. types you were the guys down in the basement looking at packet captures and, and analyzing incidents and things were going on at a policy level or a government level that we really weren't aware of and, and we didn't pay attention to Yet those things directly affect how we can do our job. So we're, we're very keen now to, to push that policy and governance education, we call it, not training, to, to policymakers and governance folks to say, look, this is what we do. This is why we do it. This is how we do it. Think that stuff. So when you write sanction rules or, or information sharing restrictions or whatever, it would be great if you sort of thought about us and, and added us into that bucket of, but these people can carry on doing stuff because they're doing good work. If that's a real difficult thing you know that's going to take a lot of time to change you know moving governments is like moving the titanic with a rowing boat but but <laughs> that's where we're trying the space we're trying to get into and we're getting some traction on that we're, we're seeing more people asking us about that it's becoming more 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 of a focus of people but at the end of the day you know if i if i, if I have a problem in certain countries i'm i'm you know sort of prohibited from speaking to them through various sanctions regimes that can't doesn't help and can't help what we're trying to do, which is to basically make the internet a safer place. Doesn't a a non-governing body organization um, or 
non-governing wait non-govern organization. organization uh shelter that and it enable you to really have conversations across the board or is it still well, subject to embargoed countries from certain areas yes and no um a perfect example we we have had over the years we have had teams from iran want to come to our conference we're gotcha. a very open conference anybody can attend well anybody you know other than this kind of problem we don't, they're not closed conferences you pay your money you can turn up so when we've had those teams we'd love them to come but the challenge is that we then have to accept money from them to register and that's you know can, can cause a sanctions problem we're a u.s organization so we have to follow the law i, I can't break the law even though i'm an ngo and then the other challenge is that some of our members, you know, are obviously, you know, I think, 20% odd of our members are US based. They can't, you know, do something that's going to be illegal because they are US companies. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there, there's a challenge there of, you know, well, do they do they step back from what we're doing? Do we do we try and restrict it? Do we subdivide our membership into this and that, which which feels very wrong and, and would frankly probably causes more problems anyway. So, so it's not just us that is our membership has the same challenge. They might want gotcha. to share information with someone in the country, but be prohibited. And if we if we facilitate it, you know, it just all becomes very very painful. So, so you might so gain you might gain one organization from Iran, but lose twenty from a, a country that yeah. can't. Yeah, very so very possibly. Very look possibly. at the political yeah. ramifications of it. Yeah, you're into it. It's a horrible choice because you know. We want the folks from Iran, but I can't afford to lose the, the you know, Microsoft and the Oracles and whoever's in the, U the U.S. Because that would not, you know, that's not a balance that works well for us. So that's where we'd like to, we'd always like to be like the, uh, you know, like law, en law enforcement and some of the medical things where there's sort of an exemption built into these things. It's like mm -hmm. they can carry on doing stuff because it's for a good purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, if we could get ourselves into that space in policymakers in thoughts, that would be wonderful. But, you know, that's going to take some time. And, and that's policy in the United States that you're looking to change. I, it, to be fair, there, there are sanctions. You know, EU has sanctions. The UK has, everybody has sanctions. So it's not just the US problem. You know, yeah. I use those as, as, as the examples that everybody knows about, but it's uh -huh. definitely not just them. Huh. And, and so working international, you have to look at whose toes am I stepping on and what's the, the lesser of evils almost. To a degree, yes. Yeah. And that's not a choice. I, you know, that's a choice I feel very uncomfortable making. Uh, and luckily, I have a board, so it's not just me making that choice. But, you know, yeah. to a degree, we have to make those calls. So what's, what's your board look like? How many people are on that? Uh, we have a 10-person board. Um, they're elected. For, each one's elected for a two-year period, uh, so five every year. So we have five. Five people are elected every middle of the year, June or so. Mm -hmm. We have folks from Japan. We have folks from Europe, folks from uh, Spain, Germany. Switzerland, US, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think where some of the others are from. Uh, yeah, we, we, you know, we, we, I mean, to be fair, anybody within first can stand for election, but it's a very diverse board from around the world. Does it have to be diverse by, by bylaws or policy, or is it, is it just whoever gets nominated and elected? It, it is very much who gets nominated and elected, and to do that, you know, you're elected by the membership, so you need to be visible within the community and be doing good stuff. That's what gets you elected. It, being good people mm -hmm. um, we are pushing quite heavily on a uh, sort of more diverse certainly girls getting more women on board both within the organization and that so we in fact in edinburgh set up a new what we call a, a boff a birds of a feather session it's it's where it's just a small informal group that tries to affect change in many ways it could be within the organization it could be externally mm -hmm. uh, called the waff boff the women of first birds of the feather session mm -hmm. so we we are very you know very keen for them to push through um, we've we've always we've had some incredible women on the board. I look back; some of the founding members uh, were, were awesome, and, and we've had some seriously good ones. But they're always in a minority numerically, which which you know, as an industry, we're not good at it. Incident response is probably even worse. But we have had some brilliant women on our board, and they've been very, very, very good. I, know, a, I can think of half a dozen. There's a there's a new movement, women in cyber. That you, there's a lot going on with, and. Uh, I think it's called Women in Cybersecurity. There's conferences. They have one in mm. Denver. There's like 1,200 people registered. 1,200. I mean, certainly the, the, the UK government's national cyber gang are, you know, busy pushing the, the women in cyber thing. They do mm -hmm. lots of work specifically for them. And lots of governments are doing it. I think it's a great thing. Yeah, I'll have to make some connections for you with people that might be able to support with that. So. That, that, that'd be fantastic. That'd well, be great. Well, yeah, we'll do that. Um, as far as um, we had, I'm looking at my notes, what we've taken. Global coordination, global language, automation, policy and governance. 
-hmm. You said, I think you said policy and governance has become your focus lately. Um, that's out of those four pillars. Is that that the most most pressing that's one? I guess first. nowadays I think they're all they're all very important. The reason it's become the, the policy <clears> one has, and that new. It's probably the last few years that one's risen purely because we've realised that we were just we weren't in that debate. So. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are various cyber norms exercises going on there's the Paris Accords and so on and at one point they, they, there was an agreement that nations shouldn't attack other nations cyber defense you know cert type functionality and we weren't really aware of that at the time which is sort of you know shame on us for not being in that space mm -hmm. um, that's something we've changed or we've pushed to change quite heavily so so I, I was at the, the World Economic Forum Center for Cyber Security annual event a couple of months ago we, we've done OECD events the IGF in Berlin and the UK, uh, sorry, the United Nations event just a few weeks ago, where they brought in NGOs to talk about problems and, and help them. So we're really pushing, as are many other organisations. It is not just us, but I think there's a recognition that you know civil society needs to be getting into these debates to make sure that they're being dealt with, and and that policymakers aren't just thinking about you know nation-state problems and, and so on. Mm -hmm. That there's a civil society edge to all of this. It's really important to us. But be it specifically, the, if you could change, if you could nuance the way you write rules and regulations so that you don't affect us, that would be brilliant. Interesting. So it's actually something I, that's why I'm asking so many questions because interest of mine, we're setting up a non-governing, non-governance or NGO for uh, a blockchain uh, that is cross-jurisdictional, and mm -hmm. uh, so the, it's heavy on my mind as far as you know. How's that organized? How did you guys do it? What problems you run into? So I'm yep. noting all Good these work. away for, for as we <laughs> get through this process and, and things we'll have to address right now. It's, it hasn't gone mm -hmm. international, but, the, you know, the, the capabilities and plan definitely is. So mm -hmm. um, what, do you, what do you worry about? What keeps you, you up at night? Uh, what do you see so, as industry problems? Or? So, so, so what worries me most, and it's harked back to the, the governor's piece, is the sort of the fragmentation of the Internet now. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I can remember when the internet, you know, I first hit the internet in the mid '90s, and it was, you know, there was this vision of information is free, and we can all we can all learn from each other, and the playing field will be leveled, and you know, nation states won't be able to bamboozle their people and all such of that, and that seems to have disappeared a bit as as nation states realise, and, and there's a degree of I, I understand that the internet is too important these days for it to be just left in the corner. It, it's you know, countries are dependent upon it for infrastructure for for. You know, government organizations and tax and, and all the things that governments do but also in terms of industry and so on so it's a really powerful tool but you know you have some governments that will take a view that, that they you know they might want to fragment the internet or they might want to control their piece and that really frustrates me mm -hmm. as we try and build this trust network globally with, with all the people we can you know to not be able to talk to a country because of, of, a, of a you know whatever reason is, is very annoying to me so so that one frustrates me right the other thing that keeps me awake at night is probably just the sheer complexity of the problem we're trying to solve. The fact that we're not very good at doing it manually because it's too many problems. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, I, you know, I hark back to when I, I ran the cert, the UK cert um, for three years, and our challenge was that ninety percent of the problems we were faced with were not particularly complex problems. They were, you know, big, things were badly configured, badly set up, not patched, the usual litany of cyber hygiene. Yet we don't seem to be getting any better at that yet we're now going to build smart cities where everything's joined together and, and you know the whole world will be talking to each other and you know real time you know heating and cars and all sorts of things yet we've sort of demonstrably rubbish at doing it for, for the, the infrastructure we've got in place now let alone the bazillion things we're going to do <laughs> so incident response is going to become more complicated you know you can't reboot a city you mm -hmm. can't reboot you know the entire traffic light system you know everybody stop for 10 minutes while i reboot the traffic light that's not so all those things, it's going to become very, very challenging. And I worry that people aren't thinking that through, to, to my mind, as well as they should. They're not planning for it. They're not exercising for it. So it's very much a, when it goes wrong, there's knee-jerk reactions, there's bad judgment, and, and things mm -hmm. go very badly wrong. Yeah. So in kind of wrapping up here, what do you need from our listener base? What, uh, how would people get a hold of you? Who should get a hold of you? How should people engage with you? Give us anything you want to put up. So it said, forum, first is a forum. So, so we're very much interested in talking, you know, bringing people together. 
Um, we have a website, www.first.org, as you probably guessed. Um, there's, there's numerous ways of contacting us on there. That has a very good overview of what we do, how we do it, where we do it. Come to an event of ours, um, you know, talk to us, come and learn what we do. But to be fair, even if you're not doing that, exercise, think about how you would react when your company, organization, whatever gets hacked or potentially has an incident. How would you respond to that? Think about that, plan for it, exercise for it, document it, get better at that. Build, build relationships with your local teams, other people in your, in your, in your industry verticals, your national C-cert, if you've got one, and most countries do now. And if you can get to join first, that would be absolutely brilliant. We'd love to have you on board. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining today, Chris. It's definitely been a pleasure. And uh, let you have a good evening over there in the UK. But thanks. Thank you. And have a good day yourself. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you for listening to New Cyber Frontier. Remember to follow or like our post and circulate each new show to your networks. We keep you informed, bring you the latest news, explore new trends, and find the hottest topics. With New Cyber Frontier, you don't have to be a computer or cybersecurity expert. Just get plugged in. We encourage you to get involved. Tell us what topics interest you and join our mailing lists. You can find us on the web at www.newcyberfrontier.com. That's newcyberfrontier.com. Check out our previous interviews and please let us know if there are any topics that you would like to hear discussed. See you next time on New Cyber Frontier.